time. Oh. 
this next part. Oh, oh, your spirit lives within me, so I will walk in your peace. Your spirit lives within me, my victory. time oh your spirit lives within me so i will walk in your peace your spirit lives within me my victory oh my victory your spirit lives within me so i will walk in your peace your spirit lives within me my victory hallelujah I am not alone oh yes he's my comfort always holds let's sing that one more time without any music tonight Oh, hallelujah, I am not alone. Oh, he's my comfort. thankful for that shepherd tonight. Amen. amen and amen. Welcome to the house of the Lord this evening. You appreciate his presence tonight. People change when they're in his presence. That changing power of the presence tonight is in this room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Did you enjoy yourselves this past weekend? Amen. I want to personally thank all the sisters that helped, that put sweat and time and money into these, these past meetings. It means a lot to me. It means the world to us. God did some powerful things last weekend. wouldn't have been there and done that without your help. So I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart. Really do appreciate you all. Does anyone have any prayer requests or testimonies this evening? Sister Rosa. Hector. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, so I, did I tell you it was Saturday morning that I was sitting here? Brother Bryce had been ministering. Yeah. 
I don't even remember what song we were singing, but I was just playing and I had my eyes closed. And all of a sudden, I felt something move my skirt. And then I felt like it was almost as if there was somebody sitting right here. And I jerked and looked up and I thought to myself, I can't believe Sadie made it past 100 people. Like, what in the world? And when I looked, she wasn't there. And I thought to myself, well, it's not a scary thing, whatever it is. Amen. There's nothing. It's not a, like, warm, fuzzy feeling or a cold, feel, eerie feeling or anything like that. But it was just this person sitting there. And I even thought to myself at one point, do you want to play? <laughs> I'll be happy to move over. But the bench, I usually sit with the rest of the piano bench to my right. It's not to my left. It's normally to my right, so I can go this way a little bit. But it, was a, it stayed through the end of the service, and my skirt on my dress, it was like a real thin kind of dress. Um, it was even, like, moved a little bit, and it was real thin, so it wouldn't have moved. It would have just hang to the, just smooth on my leg or whatever. But it was such pressure there, and su the, it stayed till everyone left, and we all left the service that day. But I did wonder if it was an angel of the Lord that just wanted to have a little fun at the piano or something. I don't know. But I just thought it'd be encouraging to hear that Satan's been kicking our tail ever since then. So don't, don't think that we're anybody but because he fought us so hard the rest of the meetings. But just to know that maybe it was a, a music musician angel. I don't know. I don't know. But they were here in our Amen. midst over the weekend. So. It was a pretty powerful experience. Amen. Grandma. Can we give the Lord one more hand clap of praise tonight? <laughs> Amen. Sister Charity.
Are you thankful for God's blessings? Amen. Sister Rosa has that testimony of them eye drops being so expensive. And God made a change to benefit you, to benefit our sister. Amen. Sister Emma. Praise the Lord. Sister Vanessa. Praise the Lord. And Aunt Becca. the Lord. I think we can all thank him for his goodness to us. We have time. Paul Paul.
appreciate the Lord. I appreciate the Lord. I know those meetings were, we invited a lot of people. A lot of people came, but they were for us. They were for you and me. Such a blessing. Amen. Such a blessing. Amen. Papa, if you could come and open our service in prayer tonight. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's all bow our heads and talk to our Father. Gracious, wonderful Savior, what an honor it is that we can bow our heads into the presence of the living God. You're not a historical God, Lord, like some might know you, but Lord, you are real. You are so real, Lord. You just want to walk with humanity and the attributes of thyself come to their full manifestation so you could help. You could walk with us. You could talk with us like what happened with the, in the garden and even more so with Adam because Adam was only able to walk with you in part. But in this hour, Lord, you have unveiled yourself Amen. like no other generation, Lord, ever was. You've made yourself known, Lord, Hallelujah. in ways Hallelujah. that the old prophets of old would just love to be standing and, and hearing the things that's being taught now and, and what you're doing in this hour, they would give anything, Lord. We know this because your prophets have told us that. And tonight, Lord, we thank you for the testimonies, for the healings. Thank you for what you've done for myself, Lord. Oh, I just want to say how much I love you, Lord. So wonderful you are. May now, Lord, as we uh, turn our thoughts to you even deeper, even, even more with more sincerity, Lord, that you would help us to get ourselves out of the way. And as the word comes forth, it would find its place within our beings. You're looking for a certain character. That's the character of yourself. You don't want a mixture. You don't want a mixture of Rory Parker and you. You want you. And likewise, each one of us will have that same testimony. As Paul said, we need to die daily. Help us, Lord, to get ourselves completely crucified, Lord, upon your cross. That you could look, that people could look at us and see you and not, and not um, the, the man that they're looking at, the woman that they're looking at. Lord God, may you bless your people tonight. Thank you for the services, Lord, that you've allowed us to partake of this past weekend and for thy wonderful presence. And Lord, now we just pray as the rest of the worship service goes on and, and we could just, with all of our hearts, just reach out and just praise your great name for you are so worthy. You're so wonderful to us. May you help Brother Sam, Lord, as he ministers the word of life. Lord, just take full control. We've noticed that you've done that many, many times for him. But Lord, just do it once again tonight, we'd ask. And we give you the thanks. We give you the praise. And we love you, Lord. And all the saints of God can say, Amen. Can you put, I'm going to turn up my praise on the screen tonight. Mm, I'm going to turn up my praise and drown out the doubt. Holding my shield of faith when I feel no alarm. When the enemy comes, oh, in like a flood, I'm going to raise up my standard. And overcome. Oh, Satan, can you hear me? 
this line is for you. Oh, you have no power over what I go through. Victory may be in Jesus, but Jesus lives in me too. So I will turn up my praise and show you what faith can do. I will turn up my praise. And drown out the doubt hole in my shield of faith. And I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, in like a flood, I'm gonna raise up my standard and overcome. Oh, Satan, can you hear me? This line is for you. Oh, you have no power over what I go through, but victory may be. But Jesus lives in me too, so I will turn up my praise, show you what faith can do, so I will turn up my praise, oh, and drown out the doubt, hold in my shield of faith. And I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, when like a flood, I will raise up. Oh, yes. Let's declare this tonight. First verse. Oh, Satan, can you hear me? This line is for you. Oh, you have no power over what I go through. Victories in Jesus, but Jesus lives in me too. Oh, I will turn up my praise and show you what faith can do. Oh, I will turn up my praise. Oh, and drown out the doubt, holding my shield of faith. And I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, a flood, I will raise up my stand. Oh, just lift your hand. Let's sing it one more time. I will turn up my praise and drown out the doubt. Hold in my shield of faith, and I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, and like a flood. I will raise up my stand. Oh, let's sing it all together now with no music. I'm going to turn up my praise and drown out the doubt, holding my shield of faith. And I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, when like a flood, I will raise up my standard and overcome. I will turn up my praise and drown out the doubt, holding my shield of faith. And I feel no alarm when the enemy comes. Oh, when like a flood. I will raise up my stand and overcome when the enemy comes. Oh, when like a flood, I will raise up my standard and overcome, overcome. Give it praise. that standard. Amen. You have a standard tonight? He's your standard tonight. Let's raise him tonight. Amen. When everything has gone wrong. Amen. Amen. Turn around and greet your neighbor tonight. And then you may be seated. I think Papa has a special for us. If he would come, just make his way up here.
Papa could come and bring his song tonight. through the storms of life tonight. Is that your desire? Amen. Can you put that up there? Because of who you are. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Oh, yes. Because 
because of who you are I give you praise sing because of who you are I will live my voice and say Lord I worship you because of who you are let's sing that verse one more time sing because of who you are I give you glory sing because of who you are I give you praise oh because of who you are I will live my voice and say Lord I worship you because of who
Can we shout hallelujah tonight? He's our provider tonight. He reigns in victory tonight. He's your prince of peace. Lord, we worship you because of who you are. Thank you, Lord, for showing yourself to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen.
that we wouldn't be here today without that cross, without God stepping inside man and doing what he did for us. Amen. Amen. And amen. As our brother would prepare himself to come. deserves praise tonight. Singing, singing I love I love you Lord singing I love you Lord. Oh do you love him? that chorus again. Singing I love. Come on now with all your heart. Lift your hands to him. Let him know you mean that tonight. Singing I oh Lord with all that's within me. With all that's within me Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah Lord. Singing I I love, oh, you, my Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise his name.
praise his name. Oh, we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen, Lord. Have your way, Lord God. Have your way, Lord. Lord Jesus we bow our hearts in your presence here tonight Lord we come to give you praise and glory and honor Lord not just with half of ourselves not just with part of our mind Lord but we stand here tonight we used to be sinners we used to be eat up with all kinds of things of this world that had shackles and chains on us We used to be marred and dirty and mucky from the world and all the stains of sin. But, oh, great God, you have washed us in your blood. And we are not that any longer by your mercy. Oh, we give you glory tonight, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being a redeemer. Not just a creator, but a redeemer. And not just a redeemer, but a restorer. Lord, restore in your children to what you had in your mind before the foundation of the world. And it's not <clears throat> a born perfect and perfect vessel. It's someone that highly, 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 highly values your grace and your blood. Lord, we, we love you so much tonight. We stand here tonight as trophies of your grace, redeemed adopted sons and daughters of God. Lord, we thank you for your mercy to us. We thank you for your presence in the atmosphere in this place. Lord, as we now turn to the ministry of your word, you say that it's quicker than, more powerful than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder the bone and marrow. Lord, I pray you go down deep tonight. If there's any demons that's got a hold on my brothers and sisters, Lord, we're going to cut their heads off tonight. We will not allow that any longer. Your prophet taught us that the armies of Satan is here to bring disease, is here to bring discouragement and depression and sorrow and shackle and chain and bondage. But the army of God is here to loose them and let them go. So Satan, I curse you, I rebuke you, I bind you, I put both of my feet upon your neck and say you're done. Get your hands off of God's property. You're done. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as your word comes forth now, I pray you'd build up each heart. That you'd rub out any make-believe. That you'd run out of it, rub out any unbelief, Lord God. And let us have hearts full of faith. That we would trust you, Lord, more than our very next breath, Lord God. More than we're sure our heart will beat again, Lord God. But that we would trust you. For heavens and earth will pass away, but you won't fail. You promised you'd leave us, that you would be with us and never leave us. We trust you in your word tonight. We pray, Lord, as it comes forth, that it finds good ground, that every single person in this room tonight will be set free from any sin that would so easily beset them, that would be set free from any shackle of darkness, any, any lie of the devil, any spirit of fear, any demon that's got some kind of filthy hold. It's got to let go tonight because the word is present to enforce it. Jehovah Nisi, you're here tonight to enforce your word. Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you, Lord. You are still strong in battle. You are still mighty conqueror. You are still the great overcomer, Lord. Build us up tonight in that most holy faith. Bless us, Lord, as we finish up this service. And, oh God, at the end of this service, after every captive has been set free, Lord, let a praise and a song of joy and worship and shout come out of this congregation that will just shock the angels tonight, Lord. We give you glory. We love you in your holy name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get to work. Turn over to Deuteronomy while you're standing. <clears throat> Our title for tonight is Are You a Believer? Are You a Believer? <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. We'll start right there and we'll start swinging after that. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. Everybody there? And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. Do you believe that tonight? It, God wrote it with his finger. Not Moses, not Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, not Pharaoh, not even Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. Elohim wrote that with his finger. He said, the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words. All the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. You may be seated tonight. Spoke out of the fire. Spoke out of the fire. I got so much material, I'm not sure where to get started. At Lord have his way. I really want to say how much I enjoyed our prayer meeting last Wednesday night. I haven't taken the time to say that yet, being busy with the meetings, and everybody was gone by the time we got done of the night, but in here, of course. But I enjoyed it. I've never been to a prayer meeting before. Not that I know of, maybe as a young boy, but, and I sure ain't never felt nothing like that before. I have felt the anointing to preach. I have felt the anointing to pray for the sick. They're two different ones. But what that was was a sweet, holy, something different I never experienced before. But that was God. That was God. I appreciate what he did for us. <clears throat> How many here tonight believes he's done? I ain't either. Enjoyed the meeting so much this weekend. So much. We, like Bethany said, we've had plenty of opposition from the enemy. Satan, every time sons of God are gathered together, Satan comes alongside. You find that in Job. Never can fail. Not, we're not exempt. Not one of us are exempt. Uh, uh, Sheriff something that William told me a few weeks ago, two weeks ago. He said a lot of people think that you're just going to sit down and lullaby until the rapture. Just, oh, just the sweetest, nicest, precious thing. He said, no, you're going to fight tooth and nail until the day you change. Amen. Tooth and nail. Who, who's who's going to stick around and fight? You going to stick around and fight? You realize that from this point forward, it's only going to get harder? I told uh, several a few months ago that you can expect in the battle that you're in and the enemy that you're fighting that you can expect every word coming out of your brother, your sister, your mouth, your husband, your children, your neighbor to be taken wrong, to be misunderstood, and to seem offensive because of the enemy that you fight. You can expect it. So you must let every word be seasoned with grace and mercy. If anyone said it's something to you, the Bible says that love bears all things. That love will cover over a multitude of sins. That love will bear with a brother or sister when they're wrong. I love the Lord for that. I sure enjoyed the services this weekend. We, like we said, we, we did have some, some uh, how do you say that? Um, demonic oppression. Uh, devil showed up. They wanted to have their part in the dedication service. And they had a little success Saturday night. Uh, I said a little success. As Bethany was leading in, in, in the pre-service, because that's, that's her job. She starts first. She starts leading pre-service and her prayer. As she's dedicated herself to the Lord is that he would show her each song to sing next, what play in, each song to play next before the singer ever starts. And a brother saw that as she was sitting there, a little black ball kept coming down and trying to hit her in the head and go back over there. Come back down, hit her in the head and go back over there. Kept trying to do that and kept doing that. And I asked her after service, is there something wrong? She said, nothing, nothing more than normal. I noticed I was really struggling getting into the atmosphere of worship. Yeah. You ever struggled to get in the atmosphere of worship before? To get broke free to that spirit, the, the, the presence of the Lord? You, anybody? Come on now. Anybody ever know that? So you know, you know what it is. You know what it is. It's demons. It's a spirit of, out of hell. It's, it's not God. God wants you to be saturated in there. 
The army of darkness, the army of hell, the army of Satan wants everything you do to keep you out of that presence. So he'll send every little thing. You, realize, you think about this yourself. How many times have you sat here and, and all thought, man, did I leave my stove on? Was my car put in park? Do this? Uh, is my windows rolled up? Is this? Is this? Well, I was kneeling here praying Wednesday night. I thought my phone rang almost the entire time. It's on vibrate. I thought it vibrated the entire time. I was like, who's blowing my phone up? I said, but I ain't looking. I ain't about to look. I don't know who's blowing my phone up. I'll talk to him. I ain't about to look. And looked and there was nothing on the phone. But my phone was vibrating the whole time. Trying to get me distracted, trying to get me to look at that instead of being what was here. We talk about all the time about entering into that dimension, that blending of dimension, leaving this fakeality and blending into that reality of the presence of the Lord our God. And, and, and Satan is against you doing it. I mean, let the cat out of the bag. Satan is against you doing it. He is against you getting in that presence. He wants to keep you chained down. He wants to keep you planted on the ground. You were not created to be planted on the ground. You were called in this day to be an eagle. Again, the cat's out of the bag. Maybe you walked in tonight and didn't realize you were called to be an eagle. Maybe you didn't realize tonight you were called to the greatest battle ever fought. Maybe you didn't realize you were called to slay the giants in the land. Maybe you didn't realize that. Well, newsflash, you're here. You're here. You love the Lord tonight? Amen. I appreciate the Lord's mercy. I appreciate his mercy. It's, I, I, I thought at one point that, uh, <clears throat> and I meant to say this during the service, that I so enjoyed that with all of our brothers and sisters, we had uh, a, couple, uh, a couple from Nebraska. We had couples from at least two parts in Texas. Only two parts? At least two parts in Texas. We had folks from at least two parts in Oklahoma, two different churches in Oklahoma. Um, we had... At least two churches in Missouri, and we had what over, and we had Florida, we had France over from Florida, had over 110 people here at one point. I, you, you disappeared into the crowd. Out there, fellowship, and you disappeared in the crowd. Not lost in the crowd, you so blended in that I couldn't tell whose you were because you're his. They're like sheep in the pasture. You know what I was at? Nobody wasn't out there. You got sheep out there, and, and you got all the sheep all gathered together, and, and nobody's out there strutting along saying, look at me. I'm better. I'm different. You're lower than me. Amen. Nope. Trophies of his grace. Trophies of his grace. I, I appreciated that. I appreciated the brothers coming out and, and saying what they did. And, and if you've never preached before, you don't know what it means to be able to step up and say something like that that could hurt someone's feelings, that could offend someone, that could uh, attack an enemy that's on someone, a devil that's on someone. Because that devil is sitting up here trying to tell us, don't you say it. You'll offend them and they'll get mad and run out of the church. If you tell them that, if you say that, they'll never come back. So as he's fighting you there, he's trying to fight you here. I've stood here and preached many times and had different spirits in the room sit there and fight me during the service. You would think we've got believers sitting here, that we've got you know, the, the greatest message ever been given to this planet, and, and then all these wonderful things. You wouldn't think you'd have to fight those much things in a church service. But it's a battle. It's a battle. Like I said, we, we, we're going to see it through. Amen. We're going to see it through. We're not sure how far we're going to get, so I'm going to... Put those aside for the moment, and we'll see what God allows us to get into. Turn over to <coughs> chapter 11 of Deuteronomy. Chapter 11 of Deuteronomy. And I, I said our, our, our title for tonight is, Are You a Believer? We just uh, stopped on a little two-part series of uh, possessing your enemy's gates. And, and again, your enemy, Brother Ram said, my own worst enemy is the one that lives between my two elbows. He said, William Branham is the worst enemy that I've got. Is me. It has to die out to me. It has to let that old man die and, and let only the life and mind of Christ live. Anybody in this room interested in something like that? That only the life of Christ be living in you? Anybody? Only the life of Christ. That's all I want is the mind of Christ. I want his presence. I want his anointing. I want all of him and all of me. That's all I want. That's all I want. That's all I want. Chapter, uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11. We're going to read several here in just a minute. But we're going to Look what it means to be a believer. Therefore, chapter 11, verse 1, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments, always. Always. Do you, you see the problem, uh, and we'll get over to Matthew 18 here in a little bit, oh, faithless and perverse generation. We'll get to that in a little bit, but, but you understand 
the army of Satan, the army of the enemy, the army of what he's done. He's, he's had marvelous success. The prophet would tell you that Satan has had marvelous success getting the church as a whole to disbelieve and doubt the word of God. To disbelieve and doubt the word of God. Now, how did he do it? We look back at the beginning. We find Genesis chapter 3 that he comes along to Eve, the first woman there ever was, living in the most perfect. She always had the perfect of days. She never had a headache. She never had kidney troubles, knee problems, back problems. She never struggled with her husband, her children. None of those things. She always lived in a perfect environment. And he comes along and gets her on one three-letter word. One three-letter word brought death to the whole human race. And so as time progresses and humanity progresses and believers, as they grow up, as they're born, as they grow up and as they pass away and they leave their legacy, they leave their mark on this world of what a believer looked like as far as a son or daughter of God. And as it comes along and you have years and years and years passed and, and each one of those believers before us now have had their time with the word in whatever amount, in whatever light, in whatever presence, anointing or use that God had for them in their day. And yet here you are. As we were to jump back and we were talking about earlier about uh, Eli and Samuel. Yeah. Eli was a godly man. He was a, it was a priest of the temple. But Eli's sons were not good men. They were not good men. And the Lord was not going to stay in the house of Eli. God had already raised up Samuel to be able to be the one that would listen to him. But you even look in Samuel's life, Samuel's sons, they weren't going to walk the same way as Samuel. They might not have been obviously as bad as Eli, but they were not like Samuel. You realize all of these things were before the Holy Ghost was given. You today, we don't have the, we, we don't have, not one of us here today have the, um, the uh, what's the word, the handicap. We don't have the, uh, the, the binding. We don't have the <clears throat> um, world against us in the fact that you have no access to the Holy Ghost. For 4,000 years, your brothers and sisters had no access to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Had no access for 4,000 years outside of just a few special cases. Enoch, Elijah, and John the Baptist in the Old Testament before Calvary had no access to the baptism of the Holy Ghost before that time. I, see, I feel like it shocked somebody that I said that. Do you understand? And I've covered this before, and I'm trying to go really slow on this tonight, so forgive me if I get excited. You understand you do not take a rapture without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Does everybody understand that? You will not take a rapture without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is the new birth, which is the life of Christ living in you. You will never, ever take a rapture without it. So the very first one that ever took a rapture was a man named Enoch. One day he was just not found. God took him. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. Okay, you understand. You can look backwards. You can look backwards and see it. See, that's the thing about hindsight. That's the thing about hindsight. And it's interesting that what Hebrews 13, 8 means. Hindsight. Hindsight. We can look backwards. So, for example, we've now been in this church now for a full five months. Tomorrow puts us in the sixth month. Full five months. You can now step back if your memory's good and say what happened in that first January first service. In the next service, you can say what happened. Now we're already past our dedication meetings. And you can say, as best your memory can say, I remember Brother, Brother Timothy preached Friday night, Brother Bryce preached Saturday morning, Brother Wendell preached Saturday night, and Brother Jeremy preached Sunday morning. You can say that. But it, uh, six months ago, you wouldn't have been able to tell that. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I had no idea who God wanted. I had no idea. But God knew. So now you can look backwards and you see what was done. Your own eyes have declared it. You've all been in this room. You felt the presence of the Lord. You saw with your eyes and, Brother Hector, with your ears what God did and spoke to those men. In the senses that you have allowed to. So you've been able to partake and be a part of what God did in this room, in our own world, just a few days ago, which you did not know about it six months before that. Staying real basic. So if you look back to looking backwards with Enoch, Enoch having the first time the baptism of the Holy Ghost and he took him. The second would have been Elijah. You don't take a rapture without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When did he get the baptism of the Holy Ghost? It's described like this. Elijah and Elisha are walking along almost hip to hip and that chariot of fire burst right between the two of them. See, John said that there's one that's going to come behind me. He's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. 
Ooh, is that, that ain't no good for Baptist folk or Methodist folk or Lutheran folk or Episcopalian. And it's too exciting for a Pentecostal. About that time, someone that's in that poor Pentecostal spirit will just fall on the floor and froth at the mouth. See, I believe in the Pentecostal blessing. I believe in the Pentecostal foundation. Don't, don't push me to one side or the other. And I ain't a Pentecost. I ain't never been a Pentecostal. I ain't never had my name on nobody's book, ever. 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 I don't care what people call me, but I believe in the Pentecostal experience. Amen. I got to thinking, if we were at 110, it's hard to count when you have little kids. We're only 10 people shy from the upper room. If we was at 110, so we was only 10 people shy of the upper room. I don't mean much to you, but I enjoy the presence of the Lord. I, and it has been my prayer that, that we spill out of here and these neighbors, everyone in this town, see what God has done in this room. And their hearts will be pricked and they'll say, I want that. What must I do to get that? Not trying to sound fanatic, not trying to seem like I'm outside of my mind or carried away. That's just my silly desire, if you want to call it that. So with having the ability of hindsight, we can look backwards and see what God has done. So Enoch took the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He took a rapture. Elijah took a rapture. Then you also have John the Baptist filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. You ain't going to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost filled in your mama's room. That was for one person. You ain't going to, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't. I'm going to point everyone. You won't get it in your mama's womb. You had to press your way into it. You're not giving it because you come shook my hand. You're not giving it because if we had a book and you wrote your name on the book, you've now got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No, no, no. Acts 19, Paul asked them, have you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost since you believed? And their response was, we've not even heard there be such a thing called the Holy Ghost. And he said, how were you baptized under John's baptism? And he told them, that ain't going to work. But John was Malachi chapter 3. John was Malachi chapter 3. John was Malachi chapter 3. God's prophet for that day. Prophet for that day. Looked right in the face of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, you're a brood of vipers. He said, you call yourselves children of Abraham. He points at the stones that Joshua and the children of Israel built in the Jordan while it was at flood stage and upon the bank while it was at flood stage and said, God is able of these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. What's a, children, what's a child of Abraham look like? Someone that has faith and believes. People say, oh, it's just too simple. That's all you ever do is preach on faith. It's too simple. You can't even please your God without faith. You can't even please him. And I tell you all the time, make yourself look silly. I don't care what you say. I want to please him. I want to please him. I, I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. I, I kind of want to hear that. I want to hear that. So as you look back and you see what God did in those days and, and all the commandments and all the statutes and all the judgments, and these men were, they were walking with it in the best of their ability. So for 4,000 years, there was no Holy Ghost that could be given. And you look back through all of those Old Testament manifestations, representations of Jesus Christ working and speaking through each of those prophets of old. Everybody still with me? God moving in those ways. Does God vindicate his word? How does he do it? By bringing it to pass. God vindicates his word by bringing it to pass. If I understand me so far, God vindicates his word by bringing it to pass. So, again, let's jump all the way back to Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Period. Verse 2. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Verse 2, keep moving, keep moving. God starts speaking, let there be light. Let there be water. Let there be this, this firmament. Let this light and this light, the light in the day, the light of the night. Let all these things, let all these things, let all these things. And if you're standing back there on this side of Genesis 1 and you're looking that way and all you're hearing is his voice, you're like, well, I don't know if it'll be or not. I don't know if it'll be or not. And then it appears. God vindicated his word. God brought it to pass. So again, the luxury the luxury of looking backwards. So we've got 6,000 years of a believer, all this, this material to draw faith from. I'm going to call it that. You have 6,000 years of material to draw faith from, um, from the living God. The living God. We don't serve a dead letter. We don't serve a dead God. We don't serve a dead word. We serve a living God who keeps his word and vindicates it by bringing it to pass. 
We serve a God like that. So keep all those things in mind. So as God would write to Moses, and he would write on this tablet with his finger, this word, this word, this law, this commandment, over and over and over until he had 10 of them written out. He did it with his finger. Moses had asked him, he said, I want to see you. And he told Moses, maybe he told him like this, baptism of the Holy Ghost ain't been given yet. The blood has not been placed on the mercy seat yet. You can't see me. But what I'll do, I'll let you see my backside. As I walk by, can you imagine how wonderful that would have been? If you only got that much. If, if Moses, at the, at the climax of his life, if, he was, if you were sitting down with Moses, what do you think is the greatest? What would you, in your last 120 years, what would you classify as the greatest experience with God you ever had? When you walked up there and you were scared to death, you're looking at the Red Sea, and, and you know Pharaoh's coming to kill you and to stomp you out till there be no more Israel, and you watch God look down with angry eyes and make the sea get scared and roll back out of the way, and you walk across on dry ground, and then he lures the enemy behind him and kills him in the same water that saved you? Or you get over there in the middle of the desert, in the wilderness, where there's no food to be found, no sustenance, no, no vegetation whatsoever, no water whatsoever, and you cry out to God, God, feed me. And now he has his angels make bread for you and lay it out at your doorstep every single night. Would that do it? Well, no, let's keep going. Okay, you were needing water, and he told you to speak to the rock, and this big old rock poured out enough water to feed at least two million men and all the horses and animals and cattle plus women and children as long as you need it will that do it no I wouldn't think that would do it he said one day I was called upon the mountain one day I was called upon the mountain I was speaking with the Lord I'm in his presence he's 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 sharing his word with me I'm seeing it being written out with his finger on a tablet of stone these statutes these commandments and I realized he really is a living God really is a living God. He's writing his word out. And then guess what happens? He let me see his backside. Now, what's the difference between God's backside and your backside? Or let's say the children of Israel's backside. See, Balaam, Balak, to try to show him the backside of Israel. You, you might, if I read the Bible enough, you understand that Balaam was paid by Balak. He was a prophet of God, falsely anointed prophet of God. He was a paid prophet of God, told him, you've got to find something wrong. You've got to find something wrong. You've got to find something wrong. He goes back and he shows him the back parts of Israel where their mistakes were, where the things they falter in, where the things they fell down, their sins, their weakness. And he said, attack that right there. Where did he get that idea from? Where did he get that idea from? But what's the difference between... Your backside and the children of Israel's backside. You should be completely encapsulated by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is that same Shekinah glory, which is the kingdom of heaven, which is the new birth, which is Jesus Christ himself living, ruling, and reigning from right here. So what's my backside look like now? It, it, it probably looks like it's dripping with blood. It's dripping with blood. My backside is going to look like his backside did. They tore his back off from me. They tore his front off from me. He was dripping with blood. I'm also dripping with blood. So again, the benefit of being able to look backward. So now we're already up to Malachi chapter 3 and that, that messenger that would forerun the first coming of Christ. And he comes out there, make the crooked path straight, prepare your way. Here comes the Messiah. Here comes God in the atoning, uh, 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 sacrificial lamb body of the Lord Jesus Christ that is specifically designed to be thorough enough to appease the wrath of God. And he does it. He said these three words. It is finished. What was finished? So again, let's look backwards. Let's see what God said because everything that he prophesies, everything he says, he vindicates by bringing it to pass. So now you have him there 2,000 years ago saying these words, it is finished. So let's slide over to about Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. He said he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. And the chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes I've been healed. So, those of you sitting here tonight, got something wrong with you, physically wise. Anything wrong with you. Crooked toenail, crooked, crooked toenail, teeth crooked, whatever it might be, he was bruised. He was wounded. 
for me. By his stripes we are healed. See, the prophet of our day would tell you, if the Lord Jesus Christ come and stood before you in the robes and in the body that he walked the shores on 2,000 years ago, and, and Samuel Webster said, Lord Jesus, would you please heal me? I've got X, Y, Z wrong with me. He would lean down and say, Samuel, my son, I already did. Amen. I already did. He can't do anything more for you than he's already done. Yep, that's right. So you now have the choice. Is this man lying to me? Because faith is that simple. Is he telling you the truth or is he lying to you? Is he telling you the truth or is God lying to you? This is why faith comes by hearing, because you see what he says. You hear his word, and you said, no, I guess my symptoms are lying vanities. I guess his word is more true than the way I feel. I guess his word is the only thing that is correct. So we must hold it. We must hold it. We must hold it always. We must hold it. So let's now slide up to our day. And I, I don't know that I'm even going to have time to get into my other scriptures tonight. We'll save that for Sunday. Let's start up for our day. We can just point it out to you and we can look backwards and we can tell you who Malachi chapter 3 was. That's pretty obvious. That's John the Baptist standing there with wool skin over him. He's eating you know, um, eat, uh, locust and wild honey and, and all those things. Yes, without a doubt, that's who that is. Now, as you slide up just a little bit more than that, give it 100 years or so, and you start that first church age messenger. Start with the first church age messenger, Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was the messenger, the angel messenger to the church of Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, he was the angel messenger. In Revelation chapter 1, you see the Lord Jesus standing there in physical form with seven stars in his hands. Amen. In his hands, and where is he standing? Come on, don't look at your Bible, tell me off memory. Where is he standing? He's standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. He's got seven stars in his hands, and he's standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. The seven golden candlesticks is his church. That's his people. That's the believers of their day. Seven golden candlesticks, each one of them. What does gold represent? It always represents deity of who his people. That's his people. That's his people. Yes, they were the seed of that day. Yes, they had the light of their day. They were anointed for a certain thing. They were anointing in the, under the ox anointing to be able to stand what they stood to be able to go through what they went through. Who here wants to have been born in the ox age? You better put your hands in your pockets. They would take women's stomachs that were pregnant and cut them open and pull their babies out and feed them to hogs. You're a Christian? You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? We'll stop that. We'll make you recant. They do things to women that would make you scream in horror. So much so that so many atheists, unbelievers will say, what kind of a God can sit there with his arms crossed across his tummy and allow such a thing like that to happen? You think he wanted that? You think he didn't do everything that he could do without stepping over your free will, without changing that? Because still things they struggle with, still things they wouldn't surrender, still things they wouldn't ask for deliverance from. I just told you, he said it's finished. Every chain, every prison door broken, every one of them shaken to their foundation, every single one of them, every single one of them, and yet you he'll have people in the last 2,000 years sitting in prison. Why? So in Paul in his day, that first star that God would start using in those days, and Paul would give his life for this gospel. I've, I don't know if I've shared this with you or not. I've seen a little clip from a movie called, I think it's called Paul the Apostle. I'm not sure what it is. It just popped up on YouTube. And, and it, it's something that is, it is really bothered me. Really, really, really bothered me. I always imagined that you would walk over and kneel down in a chopping block and you would just bow there and they would chop your head off. And the clip, the way they had this was, I don't know if it's true or not, I wasn't there. They had a stand about this high. And it kind of looked about like my hand the way it was made, a little certain way. And then in the clip, he walks over there standing, and he lays his head upon that. And that man walks behind him, and he takes that sword, and he removes Paul's head. See, that has wrecked me for the last few months. It has wrecked me for the last few months. And we think the tests, the trials we go through is worthy of this gospel. 
You think that we're deserving anything, that we're worthy of anything. And just on the first church age, a man will walk up there and give his head like that for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed. We say it. We wear T-shirts. We have bookmarks of all these things. But will you talk to your neighbor? Will you testify to anyone else? Would you testify to someone that said he could have gunned to your head and pulled the trigger if you say the name of the Lord Jesus? Would you do it? Otherwise, you're not even worthy of this gospel. You're not even worthy of bearing the reproach of Christ. I'm not talking about suicide and stupidity. I'm talking about just opening your mouth. I'm not ashamed of him. Not ashamed of him. So like I said, that's wrecked me. That wrecked me for at least two or three months. But here just recently in the Adoption Number 2 series, Brother Bram said he's on that other side now. Amen. And they got a head on his shoulders that ain't nobody take off. Amen. You can't take that head off. You cannot take that head off. He run his race. He finished his course. He pressed. Yes, sir. Pressed. First church age. Now as we move up and we come to the next church age. And in, um, in that second church age, Brother Ram would talk about, if you look at history and what things it were, you understand that before the Bible closes, before the last apostle died, the last disciple died, no one ever was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Never. You will not find anywhere in church history that anyone was ever baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. To what Jesus said in Matthew 20 and 19. So I guess for a hundred years, everybody had it wrong. What say ye? What say ye? Were they wrong or did they have a revelation? Did Paul, was Peter given the keys of the kingdom or was he not? Was Peter built upon a rock of revelation or not? Jesus told him after his ascension, after, before his resurrection, after his resurrection, before his ascension, he said, Peter, do you love me? You know, Peter, he almost annoyed him. Peter, do you love me? Yes, yea, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord. Pe three times. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Amen. So even after the resurrection, God is still looking at Peter in the, the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And this is the revelation that will be quickened and made alive once you've tarried and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Does this make sense? Revelation. Revelation. Peter and the, 120, the 100, other 119 weren't up there going through the Bible. Man, what can we tell them? What can we come up with? What can we do that, that's just going to shock everybody and we'll start our own doctrine, our own religion, and we'll just kind of see what happens? No, they were on their knees praying. You realize the Bible says they're in one heart and one accord. What if every church service was one heart and one accord? What would keep you from being in one heart and one accord? Some foul, unclean spirit out of hell. Some, I'm going to break my pulpit again. Some foul, unclean spirit out of hell would get between you and you and you and try to pull you apart. It is not the spirit of God. It is not the life of Christ. It's a demon. And it will put his hands on your throat. That is not the spirit of God. You see what we fight every service now? Your brothers and sisters pick up something out in the world. It's almost impossible to walk through this world and not get something on you. you got to be washed. you got to be constantly washed by the waters of the word. If you get something on you, that don't mean you're done. That don't mean you're dead. That don't mean you're cast away. That means you're a human living in this world. Constantly got things against you, fighting against you, trying to steal, kill, and destroy. You thought that would look like a Sunday picnic? No. Not a chance. All hell's against it. Amen. You must not have heard me. All hell is against you. Amen. So if every church service was in one heart and one accord, every church service, what would happen? Again, the way you know what God's word is true, there's something that he says. He said, tear you in Jerusalem till you're filled with power on high. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 2 in your mind. We don't have time to go there right now. And you see what happened. They were in one heart, one in accord. They were praying in the upper room. And the fire of God come into that room and lit them on fire. Lit them on fire. Now, I'm going to offend you a little bit. You seen a Methodist sit on fire? You ever seen a Baptist sit on fire? You ever seen some message believers lit on fire? Mm -mm. 
I'm talking about a sold-out love slave, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the doctrine or denominationalism or creed or those things. I'm talking about someone that's been touched with the coal of fire off the altar like in Isaiah 6. The living word, the living fire, the living God put into them and quickened alive. You know, there's not a such thing as a Methodist heaven. Not a such thing as a Baptist heaven. Independent, primitive, um, independent, primitive, Southern Baptist, missionary Baptist, there's so many. There's not a such thing. It don't exist. There's not a such thing as Episcopalian, Lutheran, Catholic. There's not a such thing as a message heaven. And I'm, I'm saying that because I know people that say I'm in the message and I'm safe. No, sir. You must be in Christ or you're lost. You're lost. And you look at, uh, again, the simplicity of our prophet. He would ask someone, are you a Christian? I'll have you know I'm a Baptist. I go to church every service. My name's been on that book. My mama's name was on that book. My granddaddy's name was on that book. Forever, forever, forever. He said, you don't even understand what I just asked you. I didn't say, did you, lo- did you latch your chain onto a morgue? I said, are you a Christian? Which means being alive in Christ Jesus with fruits following. I believe the gift of prophecy is in the body of Christ. I believe that. I believe every gift of God is available to the body of Christ. I don't believe we'll all speak in tongues, but I believe some of us should. I believe that gift is in this room right now. I believe someone won't surrender their life to let it go. That's okay. We're still here. But I believe the gift of prophecy is in the body of Christ. But until that's activated, until God is speaking in such a way, Jesus said this very profound statement. He said this, by their fruits you will know them. What's your fruit look like today? They look withered, dried up. What's your worship look like? What's your life with God look like? See, this is my problem with not just Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, because there's a lot of Pentecostal anymore that don't get into it no more. They won't worship the Lord of God. No, well, I mean, you, got, you just got all kinds of different phases, and you sure got message believers doing the same thing. <laughs> well, we don't want to look Pentecostal. We don't want to seem charismatic. We don't want to look this and this and this and this. In the upper room, that was a day gone by. That was all, all that. See, in 1965, November 1965, message, Invisible Union, right after Thanksgiving message, Brother Ram said that when that Holy Ghost falls, that it'll produce a life. It'll produce an experience. And it'll give you a staying power over against every sin. Overcome against every sin. It's what it'll give you. No, Brother Branham was influenced by all these Pentecostal men, and, and he was just kind of just trying to appease them and... Get out of here. Get out of here. First church age messenger, Paul. Keep coming up. The next one. The next one. If we had time to read Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation 3, you can watch it throughout the candles of history. From Paul to Irenaeus to Martin to... Who comes after Martin? I always get confused. Who's number four? Who's number four? Where's my cheat sheet here? The fourth messenger. We'll just call him that right there. Uh, it? It was Irenaeus. No, no, it was Columbia. Columbia. Irenaeus was number two, so we need to have a quiz right now. Okay, Paul, Irenaeus, Martin, Columba. Paul, Irenaeus, Martin, Columba, Luther, Wesley, Brother Brown. Seven, okay. They're right, okay. Each church age for their day. Now, as each one of them comes to those day, and we again have the benefit of a prophet looking backwards. And I love something that I'd heard that Spurgeon is. Everybody know who Charles Spurgeon was? Spurgeon had made a comment that he told young preachers as he trained them or give whatever advice he could, he would tell them to stay out of the book of Revelation. He said, stay out of the book of Revelation. It'll take a prophet to interpret it. Anybody ever read the book of Revelation and got confused? Anybody? Okay, so let's make this real simple again. Before the one on the left, how many people and everybody you knew thought that white horse rider, Revelation 5 or Revelation 6, which is it? that thought that white horse rider was Christ himself. Everybody did. Everybody did. Everybody. Nobody. Am I the, y'all all holy and nobody. No, everybody thought it was. Every teacher, every theologian. Oh, that's Christ. White horse. Come on now, white horse. You had a prophet with a revelation of the of revelations. The prophet standing there with the one from Revelations 10, 1 that told him, that's not me. Watch how he goes. So now, you see that revelation, white horse, black horse, pale horse, red horse, 
Again, I get those confused. Forgive me, I got a bad memory. So you can take that same thing and you can jump backwards with our view now of history looking backwards. You can start in Paul's day. You can come through up through Irenaeus' day, up through Martin's day, to Columbus' day, and keep working. And you can see those white horse riders as they move in their day. Starts out with, in the first church age and the second church age, this white horse rider comes out all wonderful and, and he looks white and, and there's no problems there. He don't even have any arrows. He won't hurt you whatsoever. He won't hurt you whatsoever. No, come here. No, come here. Come here. Come here. Just um, let's maybe, let's maybe, uh, let's change how you baptize. Just a little, let's try that. Let's change how you baptize. Let's say, let's just say that it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Just something real simple. Real simple. Who was the white horse rider again? Satan. Who's, who, you better yell it out. Who was the white horse rider again? Satan was a white horse rider. He starts trying to diminish and tear down and water the word of God. Now let me tell you why. Everybody, everybody with me right now? Let me tell you why. Because Luke 10, 19 had happened. I, cannot, I, just, I just cannot imagine Satan standing there on the shores of Galilee and he hears Elohim say, Behold, I give unto you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of darkness and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And immediately Satan goes to his battle board. Okay, what do we do? This is what he said. This is what he said. And there's nothing refuting that. There's nothing. If we don't do something now, we're done. The lake of fire will start right now. You're fighting an army. You're fighting an enemy. They're working this out. What do we do? What do we do? These men are putting this to work. The upper room had happened. They're walking out there, slaying enemies, killing demons. What do we do to stop it? First thing that appears, wrong water baptism. And you're like, that don't mean nothing. What is your problem? That don't mean nothing. Okay. In John, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except by me. This is the most very popular scripture. Everybody right? Everybody knows it? You might not be able to quote it verbatim, but everybody knows that scripture. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You know, Jesus also said, straight is the gate. Straight. That is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. That is S-T-R-A-I-T, which means water is the gate that leads to eternal life. Got to be baptized right. What happens if you're not baptized right? No power. No Luke 10, 19 for you. You walk away defeated. You walk away stomped on. You walk away in chains. You realize that angels have been watching now for a bare minimum 6,000 years. Bare minimum. I'm I'm just assuming after that because I have no idea. They They weren't created in time. Because they're immortal. They weren't created in time. Time didn't start until probably Genesis 1, 1, whatever that is. Again, I'm still presuming. because, But time didn't exist back there because they were immortal. Amen. So they've been watching all this time. And you look at, even in this, uh, let's, just, let's just slide over to where we're at right now and then a few years last. So we're not even going to talk about the 440 years there as slaves in Israel. We're not even going to talk about that right now. What Mo- God brought Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh hard and Pharaoh's hard, brought Moses up and delivered them. We're not even going to talk about that right now. Let's jump over to uh, their time spent in Babylon as slaves. Let's look at the time where that they would come in these invading armies and take the children of God and put chains on them and put them in line of other slaves and they walked out chains like this. This is what happened. Everybody understands. You, this is what they did. They chained them out and walked them away as slaves. Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, they were children that were slaves taken from Israel, taken to Babylon. Can you imagine Those angels that had heard these words given to human flesh and now they're, can you imagine they're going, what is going on? What is going on? All you had to do was keep that word. That word keeps the chains off of you. Come on now. That word keeps the chains off of you. Oh, that's too simple. That's too simple. Man, you ain't been in prison long enough. You ain't had it bad enough for something. It, it keeps the chains off you. The Word does that. The Word keeps you free. The Bible said, he that the Son has set free is free indeed. This is the Son. 
the living word. It's the Father. It's the Holy Ghost. Same person. Amen. So now let's, let's, let's see how Satan, what Satan would do. Because he brought in that Trinity doctrine of being three different people. And they confirmed it with baptized in the name of, see, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he said, baptize in the name of. Pull that up, Charity. Matthew 28, 19. I want you to read that. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Now, maybe you think, maybe you think that our Bible app that we're using has a lot of errors and typos. Maybe you think. What so many other people thought, that that should have had an apostrophe S after name. Look at it. Look at it. In the name. If this was in your Bible, it would be in red letters. Jesus speaking. Baptized in the name. Is that good English? It's not good English. You would say, if it was three different people, it baptized in the name of Sister Deborah, Sister Presley, Sister Emma Kate. In the names of Sister De- that's good English. In the names of Sister Deborah, Sister Presley, Sister Emma Kate. That's good English. In the name, singular, is not good English. Because it's one person. So now, you look back at who was Jesus' dad. Who was Jesus' dad? The Bible said the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she was found with child. Jesus said, is, let me ask you this, is Jesus a liar? Come on now, is Jesus a liar? He is not a liar. God cannot lie, God cannot change. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. I come in my Father's name. Well, I just don't understand who his daddy was. Who was his daddy? Who was it? Was it the Father or was it the Holy Ghost? They're the self-same being. Self-same being. So if that's the same one and that's the same one, who's the son? The same one. I know this is too simple, but this is where you get power and this is where you get victory in the truth of the word. Now, for all those years, each one of those reformers coming up, so many of them, even though God had a light for their day, most of them still baptized wrong. You you talk about uh, differing amounts of light for each day. Again, remember the book was sealed. Remember, the book was sealed. If I was to have you come up here and and I'm going to say that I'm the seal of this book and I want you to peel those pages back and see what you can see. And you're like, well, I can get open and I see an L and I see a me and I see a sealed book. You know that it was said about John Calvin. Everybody knows who John Calvin was. That he actually killed a man who baptized the 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 name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had, an, a good, he had an understanding of predestination, but he killed a man who baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ. Very minimal light for his day. Very minimal light for his day. This is all history. You can all go back and look. All history. All basic, basic, basic stuff. I'm not making this up. It was written a thousand years before I was ever born. I wasn't allowed to make it up back then. I know too many people, they'll, they'll say, well, no, you, no. And it's just, you've got to walk back through these things, every little tiny little step, so the devil won't get traction in your life. Amen. In a law, lawyer's case, he would say it's proven beyond the shadow of a doubt. So, now, jump to Acts 2.38. Amen. Come on. Yes. Charity, Acts 2.38. basics of being a believer the basics of being a believer they come stumbling out of the upper room they see what's happened they see these men's lives changed you know i would think it'd be a good it would be a fair assumption a fair assumption to know that some of the people that were there might have known peter might have known thaddeus might have known Bartholomew. Might have known some of them. Sure, thank you. You, you. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Come on, everybody else. Thank you, Joseph. That will be a fair statement that somebody else probably knew one of those, Andrew or Philip. I, I know we're getting late, but come on, stay with me now. That's a pretty fair statement. And now they come stumbling out of a room different. Hallelujah. Different. Something's Different. And these men look at him and say, wait a minute, men and brother, what can we do? I want that right there. 
You know what? It looks to me like when she lays her head on her pillow at night, she goes right to sleep. She got no depression. She got no anxiety. She ain't stressed out. She looks to me like she's got peace. Where'd she get it? Men and brethren, what can be done? Peter said unto them, repent. Oh, that's too hard. Brother Brown said, one of the greatest things he's seen a man do is stand up in front of other men and say, I was wrong. I was wrong. So God doesn't do anything for nothing. He starts it out right there. Peter, what do we do? Repent. I believe you got to make everything right. I believe if you don't make everything right, Satan still got you. And you can get baptized as much as you want. It ain't going to do nothing. You can get baptized as much as you want. It won't do nothing. You can get baptized with a prophet, with anyone. You can get baptized by an angel of light, anything you want. If you don't do that part right there, repent, you have wasted your time and their time. This is the word. This is true no matter what you think about it. This is true no matter what you think about it, to repent. Now, I believe... And I believe I can come up with enough scripture to back it up. That you have to make everything right. That you don't have to go to, if I've, let's say I've, I've wronged Sister Penny. I can't go by Matt and say, look, Matt, I've, I, I said some things about your mom. I thought some things about your mom. And, and just, I want to make it right between you and me. And I've talked to God too and we're all good. Is that going to work? I've got to go to her and tell her everything I said. I can't walk by and say, hey, I, my bad. And she's like, what? 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 I didn't think there was nothing wrong. I didn't. No, I got to tell her what I said. I got to tell her what I meant by it. I got to tell her what I meant by it. And I don't have to stand up. Well, me being the pastor, I probably do. But you wouldn't have to stand up and tell every person in the room word for word what you said. You could just, I would say that it would be fair, if it's safe enough to say, look, I wronged my sister and we and her have made that right. And now we're clear between, our conscience are clear between us. She's forgiven me, uh, and we're, we're, we're set free. But I cannot walk by and say, you know, uh, my bad, you know, no big deal. I got to make it right. Or Satan's got a hook in me. See, it'd be so beneficial right now if I could put a demon right there that you could see. It would benefit you so much. And your walk with Christ, if I could have your eyes open right now and you'd see a demon standing there with his claws, that would benefit you so much. And you would understand that when I say that if you don't repent of anything and everything in your life, this thing gets you. Do you agree? Or would you rather walk away letting him get you? What if I had the ability to open the eyes of you and you would see what's on you right now? What takes your joy? What takes your peace? What keeps you sitting in your seat? What keeps your mouth shut? What keeps your hands down? What keeps your praise shut off? That ain't the spirit of Christ. That's a demon on you. What keeps bitterness in your heart? What keeps wrath, malice, bitter, uh, jealousy, envy, emulations, strife? What does that? That's a demon out of hell. But I'm a believer. I've been baptized right. I believe the message, the revealed truth of the hour. I believe that one on the left. I believe that's Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, 6. I can prove it by the Bible. It was proven and proven night after night after night. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. But if you won't repent, that thing stays on you. Again, I know this is way too simple. But I, I, I want an army of God that's in marching condition. I want this army of God in marching condition. So you're still here. Every one of you are still here. Whether you disagree with me, whether you're mad at me, whether you hurt at me, whether you got complex with me, no matter what it is, you're still here. I am the pastor of this church by God's design. I am the one that's been given the ability and the grace of God to be able to stand here and be the shepherd of this church. I am the one he will look at if you're not in marching condition. I am the one that will pay. If you're not in marching condition, I'm the one that will stand and give an account of you. The Bible teaches this. I will stand as a pastor of this church and give an account of you. You mean prove it by the Bible? Ask me later. I can show you the scripture. 
The, the, our prophet taught us, this ain't a job you want. This ain't a job you, um, what's the word, a uh, campaign for. You run from this job. You run from it. You literally hang between life and death. I hold you between life and death. If you get confidence in me, which you should, if you love me, which you should, if you trust me, which you should, if you believe me, which you should, and if I leave the word and I put some doubt in your heart, I have hurt you over death. This is why the prophet would tell you, pray for you, pastor, because I'm just as human as you are. I'm probably more human than you are. Most of y'all have some you know, nice halos. I want the army of God in marching condition. I want all unbelief. I want all doubt. I want all fear out of your heart. And I, I asked last Wednesday night who was willing to stay and fight. And every single person that was in this room had raised their hand that you're willing to stay and fight. You raised your hand. Those that were here you said, I'll stay and fight. And again, I tell you this all the time. You ain't no cruise ship. This ain't no luxury liner. This is heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. Now, you can be lazy all you want. You can give up all you want. You can sit there and pout and hide your face from me when I look at you and bury your eyes in the floor when I look at you all you want. But I love you. I'm fighting for you. And if you give me the opportunity, I'll kill any demon that's on you. But you've got to give me the opportunity. You have to give me that opportunity. You understand what headship means? What the gift to you of headship means? That what God has set up to be your pastor that I would be the same thing to you if I've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost as you're, you're my thumb. Do you understand that? That God, if I am in my right position as God, if I am full of the Holy Ghost, if my life is clean and clear before him, if I'm walking in the revealed truth of the hour, you have a need, you have something you're struggling with, you come to your pastor and you walk it out with your pastor and he would judge that matter, something that's on your heart, judge what you're going through. The prophet teaches this, the Bible teaches this. You walk back through each part of it. And if you've got confidence in the Urim of Thummim, you'll say, that's, that's right, that lines up with the Word. And you want a pastor that's living in the Word, that's constantly in the Word. That way I can tell you what the Word says. Amen. And you're not going, you know, I don't think he quoted that just right. I think that, not even misquoting, I think he misinterpreted it wrong. The prophet tells us three things you don't do. You don't misplace, you don't misinterpret, and you don't misconstrue. I, forget, I, always forget. I just, just said it the other day, I hate my memory. Lord, forgive me, I don't mean that. It just shows you my human frailty. It just shows you my, I'm just human too. Like I said, I, I want this church in marching condition. I want these hearts full of faith. Amen. There is so much. There is so much available to you in this day, in this hour. I, I look around the room, look at all these different brothers. He was born in England. She was born in Georgia. I almost pointed wrong, but not in Kansas. He wasn't born in Kansas. She wasn't born in Kansas. She was. She was. She wasn't. She, he wasn't. He was. All over the world, each one of us appointed Levi, all over the world, all over the, the U.S., all over the different places, moved here for a purpose. All differing birth dates. That always gets me. See, that always gets me. See, I was born August 26, 1980. I was born at the end of the half hour of silence. I was born at the opening of the word. When I was born, the seals were already open. When I was born, the line of the tribe of Judah had already stepped forward and claimed every redemptive right. When I was born, he had unveiled himself. That's when I was born. Now, if you were born before February 28, 1963, you couldn't say that. You couldn't say that. 1959. I don't even, I won't say you're, you get mad at me. <laughs> Different years. But yet here we sit tonight. Amen. We're not sitting under a Methodist doctrine. Right. That's three church age messages, two church age messages ago. We're not sitting under a Methodist doctrine. We're not gathered around, uh, to, and no offense to anyone that started out Methodist, we're not gathered around a Methodist idea, a Methodist creed, a Methodist understanding of this book. Right. No, are, you, are we Methodist? No. Do we need to start sprinkling the babies? Do we need to start uh, everything the Methodists teach? No? Okay. Also, we're not born under the Pentecostal doctrine, the Pentecostal age. No, sir. Yes, Laodicea is going on out there. You've been called up somewhere higher. You are sitting in Revelation chapter 4. So I'm telling you, there's so much available. There's so much available. The revealed open word. But it does not matter. It does not matter if you don't even believe it. 
It don't help you one bit to know that God sent a prophet. You're like, I don't believe that. I can twist some scriptures around. I've got a misunderstanding. I mean understanding. And, and I can twist some things around and, and say that wasn't him. That wasn't William Marion Branham. Not with the revelation of God, you won't say that. So now we've got to look close to our day. That seventh star, that seventh messenger. You realize this is the same one that Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, and we'll probably get this on Sunday. The same one that said, behold, I send unto you. Okay, let's back up off that scripture just a little bit. Let's go to Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. He said, behold, the day burneth as an oven. It burns as an oven. That all hell is turned loose upon the earth. Anybody looked outside lately? Anybody looked outside lately, what it looks like? See, this is where I've told you I've had some success witnessing the people. They want to talk about, well, you know, we don't know where we're at. We don't know, but they start with, you know, obviously we're in the end of days. We're obviously in the end of days. Obviously. we got people on the news ladder. They're joking about it. All these different things. Newscasts, what I meant to say. All these different things. They're joking about it and kidding. They're making movies about it. All those things. End of days, end of days, end of days. And I don't disagree. But I believe the Bible. And the Bible says, before. Before then, before that happens, I'll send unto you Elijah the prophet. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And he'll do something. Anybody remember off the top of your mind what he'll do? Malachi chapter 4, verses 5. Behold, I send unto you Elijah the prophet. And he will turn the hearts of the children of the fathers, the hearts of the fathers of the children. That original faith. So again, if you don't even believe that's Malachi chapter 4... You're missing everything, 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 everything. So just as, a, as we run out of time, I'm going to give you a little bit more. So he's not just Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. He's not just that. He's also Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. So again, we'll, we'll start back where we went. In Revelation chapter 1, we all agreed, you remember off your memory, that Jesus was standing, there were seven stars in his hand. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, it said, be, uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound all, all, all the mysteries of God shall be finished. I heard something recently that I love. See, Sister Vanessa has come into the message in what, three years now? It's not four yet, is it? Might be four. Is it? I'm so sorry. I'm, I lose track. Forgive me. Unless you get me later. Four years. Well, the Matt, Sister Erica has been in a year and five months, not counting the two of the November. And you think about what God has opened up, what you've allowed to see. See, when something in the Bible has a lot of mysteries in it. You, who reads your Bible? Everybody here, you read your Bible, right? So the Bible has a lot of mysteries in it. And you'll agree to that. A lot of mysteries. As long as it is a mystery, you can't have it. You realize that? Because guess what? It's a mystery. I know it's very simple. But I just quoted to you Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, with all the mysteries of God should be finished. That means revealed. That means open, laid bare. Sister Presley, look at the mysteries of God. You, you, can you see? You understand? It's been made bare. Sister Vanessa, you come, you look. I can show you the mysteries of God. I can show you plainly what they say. You heard me right. You, you heard me right. Plainly, plainly, plainly what they say. No, that's too deep. That's too high. That's too big. That's one side of the coin. Then you have other people over here that's got such a heady and high-minded, oh, it's too deep for you to understand. You're not smart enough. You're not well-taught enough. You're not a theologian enough. If Satan can't push you off the edge, can't keep you from something, he'll push you off either side of the road for it. But again, the plain, simple truth, they're finished. They're open. But again, if you don't believe it, what's it do for you? You could be sitting in this church right now. You could have literally above, let's just say, right above your head. Right above your head, and just start out like a pyramid, a cone, the mysteries and all the open word right above your head, waiting to drop right into your heart. Right into your heart. And your mind will go back to the scripture when they were sent 12 spies into the land to spy it out, to see what the fruit looked like, to see what the land looked like, to see what the water looked like, and what the honey looked like. And you had uh, 10 of them come back with an evil report. And uh, is it Hebrews that calls it? They had an evil heart of unbelief. So make this real clear. They're walking up to the grapes of Astral. One. 
They're looking at the beautiful land. They're looking at the water. They're looking at all the land. And they're like, not mine. They wouldn't believe it. I know faith is very simple. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. You heard me right. Impossible. Impossible. See, this is where you see the grace and glory and mercy of our Savior. You ready? With him, all things are possible. So now you see how you get a revelation. Now you see where mercy comes from. Now you see the opening of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ, the open word, the finished mystery, and it's made plain, plain for you to see. But you got to come God's provided way. Got to come God's provided way. I, was, I, I think about this a lot. The prophet had an experience one time out in the woods. He said he was walking up to the place where they had created those, the Lord had created those squirrels. He said as he's walking up there and he's watching a rainbow coming down the trees and dropping in this one particular spot. And as he's walking up to that, he can see as he gets closer, he sees that seven colored rainbow dropping down into one little spot right there. And he walks up closer. He said, I knew then, he said, I should stop. I knew that I should stop. He said, I thought, maybe I'll take my shoes off and see if I can get a little bit closer. And he said, I got a little bit closer with my shoes off. Now, why would he know that? Yeah. I'll jump back here to Moses on the mountain. He said, Moses, take your shoes off. When he came up the pillar the burning bush, in, in, to the burning bush in, in, in Exodus, he said, take your shoes off. You're sitting on holy ground. Right. Amen. Everybody know the Bible well enough to know that God told Moses to take his yeah. shoes off. Yeah. That God said, Moses, take your shoes. Everybody understand me? What if Moses would have said, no, 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 40 years I've been trained by the smartest minds of Pharaoh, the smartest everything Egypt had, and they've done told us with our theology, creed, and misunderstanding that I can just take my hat off and be okay. What do you think he'd have got from God? Nothing. Because it must come God's provided way. Can you imagine the murderer? Moses was a murderer. Absolute murderer. Going back to the children of Israel and said, God has come down to deliver thee. God has come down to deliver me, thee, and he's using me to do it. And they'd have said, you're a murderer. Get out of here. We won't accept you. We don't believe you. You saw a burning what? Can it really be as simple as faith? Whether you think God's a liar. I understand there's a lot of liars out there. Satan is the father of lies. Satan will lie to you all day long. He'll twist up everything he can, but he can't back it up with the word line by line. Even when he come to the Lord Jesus and he was trying to twist the word, the Lord Jesus with a revelation of the word just said, this is what it means. This is what it means. You don't tempt the Lord thy God. You don't do that. It's just backwards and forward. But he had to know the book to be able to, t to combat him with the book. And would you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ believed his own word? You're telling me that Elohim, the creator, believed his own word. So if you're sitting here tonight with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, see, the Old Testament called him Emmanuel. Everybody sound familiar? Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus said, and that's what he was before the cross, before the blood price, before he's now made a way that you could come boldly. He was Emmanuel back then, but Jesus said, I'll be with you, God with us, even in you to the end of the world. In you. In you. But God believes his own word. So if he is in you tonight, if you've had that experience with him, if you've been justified... Let me run through that real quick. I know I'm late. Justified. Justified, as Brother William had told you, that was a beautiful analogy. Taking a cup that had been laying out in the middle of a pig pen. Now, I raised pigs a couple years ago, and pig manure is some of the most stinkingest manure out there. Over cows and chickens, and that's the extent of my knowledge. It's some of the most stinking manure out there. And if you had a really nice-looking cup laying out in the middle of a pig pen full of manure, and someone picks it up, they picked it up, and they said, look, I've justified it. I've saved it from the pig pen. And the cup's going, I'm so happy, it smells so bad, but I still stink. I still stink. Simple. So now you must begin the sanctification process. This is not overnight. This is not overnight. He has to clean the outside and the inside. 
He has to clean. Now, that's the sanctification process. We just had on this board, Matthew 28, verse 19. He said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The prophet of our day would tell you what God did was he took those attributes, those manifestations of Elohim. He is a father. God loves fatherhood because he's a father. He's a son. He's the Logos. He's the anointed one. And he's the Holy Ghost. Same person, self-same person, all three times. The prophet taught was in those attributes. He walks through your life cleaning you up. You could say, Lord, I started this walk with the most nastiest root of bitterness in my heart. Lord, I started this walk with the most nastiest set of wrath and emulation. You know what emulation is? Emulation is always trying to one-up, always trying to brag. I'm the best. I've done this. You've done that. Oh, I've done ten times more than that. Oh, I've done so much more than that. Strife, envying, malice, fornication, adultery, all, is there 17 of them, I think? Every one of those, you started your walk with that. You and Bo, I both were born in this world in sin, shaped in iniquity, was coming speaking lies. Each one of us, not a perfect person spitting here, sitting here. That's the way you come, and you were born the wrong way. You were not intended to be born in this world like that. You were intended to be spoken. But even in that, everything that the devil meant for, for defeat, everything he meant for evil, everything he meant to destroy you, God used it for your good. Because now you can see him walk through your dirty, filthy life cleaning you up. And would you believe that he actually wants to do it? That he wants to do it? Most people go, you hire, you hire a cleaner, a maid company to come to your house. You had a big kegger or, or a, a, a sewer back up. And every toilet's exploded and manure everywhere. And, and there's maggots everywhere. I walked in a house years ago. That it was, the floor was crunchy. And I walked in. I didn't understand. The guy said, do you know why the floor is crunchy? I said, I didn't know. He said, because it's covered in maggots. So how many maids would say, yeah, I'll clean that up. I'll go through it. I'll make it spotless and white, white as snow. Nobody wants that job. He said, I want that job. He said, I want that job. I'm their re-reward. I'm their redeemer. I'm their restorer. I'll clean. And he walks through with every attribute of God. Why were there seven redemptive names of Jehovah? Why were there seven redemptive names of Jehovah? Jehovah Jireh. The provider, Jehovah Rapha, the healer, Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Amen. Well, we only know God as a healer. That's all we know. Yes, I break a bone, He heals it. I get cancer, He heals it. My eyes went out, He healed them. My brain went out, He healed those. But when I lay down at night, I am so knotted up and fit, and just I'm just I can't I can't even rest. I'm just my mind is in turmoil, and and I'm just I'm mad at this person, and I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. I've got such a spirit of fear on me that I don't. You know what I need? I need a Jehovah Shalom. Amen. I just shared the other day a, a testimony of, of Sister Jessica Conroy being delivered from a spirit of fear. Spirit of fear. She was so scared to even go outside with her kids. Thought somebody would steal them and take them. Spirit of fear, and that's just one manifestation of it. Spirit of fear will manifest in many different areas. Spirit of fear. He said, I did not come to bring you a spirit of fear or bondage, but of a sound mind, peace, and joy. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all stand our feet tonight. Do you believe him? Are you a believer tonight? What awaits for you then if you actually are a believer? Because you've stood here tonight, as I've asked you, are you a believer? And you have nodded your head, you've twitched your head, you've thrown your hands up, you've said amen, you've said yes. But by their fruits you'll know them. Amen. See, the prophet would tell you that anything God leads you to believe is yours. Anything God leads you to believe, it's yours. You wouldn't have known that without that man right there. You wouldn't have known that. You wouldn't have known without that man on the left that power without character is satanic. You wouldn't have known that. You'd have been trying to call thunder down on someone too and trying to kill them if they cut you off in traffic or if they said something wrong to you. You wouldn't have known that. But God has sent a prophet in our day to restore that faith. And again, 
Just because the seals are open, just because he's here, just because the opening bells revealed the way, don't do you no good if you don't believe it. Amen. You say, that's not for my day, that's off in the future. That's sometime coming. He's the God of tomorrow, not the God of today. You're taking words out of the book. What happens when you take a word out of that book? Revelation 22, you should be able to quote it. Your name will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. If you take one word out of that book, your name will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life. Amen. What happens if you add to it? Satan added three-letter word to Eve. Every plague in this book will be added unto you. My life upon you are the one, the only morning stone of my heart, my bright and morning star. Oh, Jesus, you are. Oh, you are. Oh, Jesus, you are. time of trouble you are the one oh you care for me you are the rock of my salvation the one I base my life upon you are the one the only cornerstone of my heart my bride you are oh, yes, Jesus you are let's bow our heads great and mighty God creator of heavens and earth author of life giver of every good gift my savior my redeemer my restorer my healer the lifter of my head, the bringer of my joy, my best friend, my maker, my husband, my Lord Jesus Christ. How we adore you, Lord God. Lord, your word is so beautiful. It's so wonderful, Lord Jesus. Precious, Father. I pray, Lord God, that you would take these words, put them in the heart of every believer, Lord, and, and let them believe it here tonight. Let there be no unbelief in the room. Let there be no make-believe in the room. Let them be a heart of a believer, Lord Jesus. Lord, quicken your word. Make it alive to each one here tonight. Lord, open us up to the supernatural. Open our lives up to your word, to your life, Lord. The reality, the unfailing realities of a very living God. We worship you, Lord. I pray that you bless my brothers and sisters. That, Lord God, as they would leave here, Lord, if there had been any doubt, if there had been any kind of spirit of fear, if there had been anything hindering, Lord, that it would be cast down. Cast down and trodden under, Lord, with their feet. Lord, let them understand. Let, let them under, get a revelation tonight of who they are, what you've done for them, what you, they mean to you, what they're supposed to do, Lord. Help us here tonight. 
Be with us as we go our separate ways. Thank you for being a real present help and a living God. Lord, we love you so much tonight. Lord, be with us. Bring us back Sunday, Lord, with a heart full of faith. On fire. On fire with your word, Lord God. Can't, can't contain ourselves. Can't sit still because we're seeing the unfailing reality of a living God. Lord, quicken us and make us alive in your presence. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise in your wonderful and holy, lovely name. Amen. Amen. If you have need of prayer tonight, we'd be happy to pray with you. You are the one, the only cornerstone of my heart, my bright and morning star. Jesus, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, Jesus. Sing it again. When I'm lonely, you are my strength when I am weak. You are my peace in time of trouble. You are the one, oh, you care for me. You are the rock of my salvation, the one I base my life upon. Oh, you are the one, the only core stone my heart my bride and morning star oh, oh, oh Jesus you are oh you are Jesus Oh. 
ask you to do that tonight. Right there where you're standing. Let the presence oh, of the Lord wrap his arms all around you. Oh, surround me. Oh, and let, let your, your presence fill this place. Way.